in pharmacy at University of Puerto Rico, and then joined the joint PharmD residency program here at UK, completing his PharmD degree here. He's a clinical pharmacist and has served on the faculty at University of Puerto Rico, University of Cincinnati, University of New Mexico, and mostly at University of Texas, where he came up through the ranks uh, to clinical professor uh, and then assistant dean at UT Austin, and then moved to his current uh, position as the founding dean at the University of Texas at El Paso. Dr. Rivera is widely published and speaks quite a bit, mostly in areas of complementary and herbal medicines, cross-border practice differences, cultural competency and care delivery to the Latino community. But he manages to continue to do something near and dear to my heart, which is clinical trial research uh, throughout his career. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Rivera. I look forward to hearing from you. Oops, and you're muted because it's a Zoom for. That will be helpful. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And um, it has been a challenging week for me, but uh, we're here. So hopefully we can, I can share with you some of my uh, career pathways and crossroads and how do I went from one place to another and why. Uh, so I'm gonna share with you a few slides that I have. Um, they're primarily to guide me and hopefully I won't jump too fast into another phase of my career. Um, of course, it has been a long career, as you know, so it has a lot of elements. Uh, so I'll go ahead and start. Um, so I'm calling this uh, virtual um, visit University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. Um, so I'm, I'm basically, I started as a founding dean in 2015 when uh, um, the state appropriated some funding to, to establish a standalone school of pharmacy. Okay, so I'll start with this little map. And one of my trips to Puerto Rico, going back from, you know, um, Many of the trips that I took from, you know, when I was in Kentucky, it was like one trip because I didn't have any money to be able to make more than one trip. But then Cincinnati, New Mexico, and, and here in El Paso, I have taken many trips back to Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico is a small island in the Caribbean. It's about 100 miles long, 35 miles wide. The biggest city you probably know is San Juan. And that city is on the northeast part of the island. Uh, it's, it's about 2 million people living there in, in the greater San Juan area. But I'm actually from the center of the island, a town that actually the name doesn't come up in this map because it's smaller than the others. Jose, hey, we uh, can't see your slides. You can't? Sorry about that. Let me go back and see how can we do this. Uh, let's see. So technology has been a challenge um, for me going back and forth between university and where I'm at. So let's see if I can. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Great, that's much better. Um, basically, this is the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, it's 100 miles long, 35 wide. I'm from the center of the island, so it's basically a spot right around here. It's a small town. Uh, most of the island has mountains, so I'm from the mountains. So I, I relate to Appalachia in that way. Uh, we're called Hibaros if you're born in that part of the island. So this is actually the, the town um, in the environment where I first 
um, where I, I was born. It's not specifically in that house, by the way, it was in a different house, but that's the environment that we're talking about. So this is a very cool, um, no air condition, no heating necessary. Um, it's very green. A lot of things grow, as you can see. Uh, this is actually a house that we do have up in the mountains. So, so I'm, I'm from that part of the island. So after I was born around when my age was about four years old, my father moved to San Juan. And we grow, grew up, well, actually first, the first thing that we did is that we have seven kids and two adults drive from the mountains to San Juan. And that was uh, in a, a, a car that's supposed to seat five people. So um, there were kids all over the place uh, when we were traveling to San Juan. Um, in San Juan, San Juan, I grew up in a middle class, kind of on the lowest middle class part of town. But my father worked at the post office. And the reason why he was able to take, get a job at the post office is because he was military. He actually did uh, sign up for the second war. And uh, he was on his way to Hawaii when Pearl Harbor happened. So um, by the time he got there, there was a lot of destruction, but he was in the military for a few years and that's why he was given um, a federal job as part of uh, what you know, some of the veterans will get. Um, but this is actually the University of Puerto Rico, the Rio Piedras campus. And this basically, it was an opportunity for me to do something that my father or my mo mother could not do, which is be able to get a higher education. My father finished high school. My mother, uh, she went up to about fifth grade, um, but with seven kids, she was re really busy. So he was the one that was able to get a job. Uh, he did not make it in, into college because there was a requirement that you have to join to the IRO ROTC at that time. And he just didn't have, uh, the funds to be able to do that. So for me, it was a great opportunity to be able to uh, gain additional knowledge. And this is something that I talk over and over and over with young people about these opportunities uh, not everybody has. And for me, it was very stimulating to be in that environment where I could learn more. Uh, so, and it was a broad experience in terms of learning. It was not just pharmacy. Um, from here, basically, I completed my BS degree. Before I could uh, actually graduate, I was, uh, I was asked if I was interested in going to the US to get a, a degree in something that was called PharmD. It was like a clinical pharmacy. And for me, I didn't have any idea what that was because we have one lecture of one hour on clinical pharmacy. Our curriculum back then was more on the emphasis of industry and basic pharmaceutical sciences. Um, but uh, we did get one hour lecture. So I had a, some little bit of an idea of what that was. So with that, I, I basically agreed to go ahead and, and uh, look into it. So my first experience was in New Orleans. There was a meeting there. It was an ASH meeting, ASHP meeting, I believe. And that was where I had to interview. And I remember I interviewed with Tom Foster. He's no longer with us, but um, he was a young faculty at UTEP, or not at UTEP, at UK. And uh, it was very stimulating to see this advanced um, individual talking to me, asking me, some questions. And I remember that he asked me about thoracine. Do I know what thoracine is? And I was able to answer that. So I, so I, that stuck with me because I mean, an, an antipsychotic, he was more of a critical care at that point working in the ICU. But uh, uh, that was my interview. So my exposure to the US was New Orleans. And I thought, well, that's not too different than San Juan. All San Juan has a similar architecture actually than the, the French Quarter. So uh, after that, I was admitted and I was asked to come to Kentucky. 
Now, before I left, um, I want to show you a little bit of what my experience in Puerto Rico was. This is actually the castle that uh, is around all San Juan. And you see those walls, uh, they're amazing, you know, in terms of the size of those walls. That's the that's an actual castle. Uh, it's called uh, El Morro, and it's in and the tip of Old San Juan. And if you look down on those, on, on, farther into that picture is La Perla, which is a city that is outside uh, Old San Juan walls. And initially, there was a lot of poor people in there, um, but actually, it has become such a special place now. So actually, my son is standing there. That's not me. I'm not that skinny anymore. So the other places where I enjoy uh, was the beach. I was actually, I call myself a playero because I spend time on the beach all the time, every weekend that I could. So this is one part of the island. It's called um, Rio Grande, which is interesting because we, we have a Rio Grande in, in El Paso which is not that big anymore because of a dam in New Mexico, but it's the same name. And so this is a, a beach that I actually, my brother has an, a, an, an apartment and I, I have gone there many, many, many times. It's called Vereda del Mar. So then I ended up traveling to Kentucky and actually it was such an amazing, a difference, you know, in terms of from my culture, my background, my uh, my environment, there was a lot of sounds in San Juan. Uh, sounds from coquis that are these frogs that sing all night, and from airplanes that fly over the the house where I lived, from cars driving by with music and neighbors with music, and and I ended up in Lexington, Kentucky. So I went from a almost 2 million people to, at that time, it was more like 125,000 people in Lexington, which was very quiet. Um, and it, it was very different in terms of the, the environment. And culturally speaking, I mean, Lexington was a wonderful place to be. Um, but at the same time, when I first came to Kentucky, I had to take two courses, summer courses. One was English as a second language, and the other one was actually um, medical terminology, which I, I basically did very well on both. Um, but I did meet people from other parts of the world that were there in Kentucky uh, going to school. And uh, it was this first time that I met people from the Middle East and from Africa um, and, and so on. So it was a really good experience. I had a really good teacher and she was very patient. Um, and one of the projects that they asked me to do is how to make a piña colada, which I, I actually did um, uh, as a, you know, I have to explain how you do this. Uh, and by the way, the history of piña colada goes all the way back to the pirates in the Caribbean. A specific pirate is called Pirata Cofresi that he gave this to his sailors to keep them happy. But uh, uh, basically in Kentucky, I, I just had an incredible experience. And now the first few months, it was a very uh, difficult transition because I, I was quiet and you know I was afraid to make mistakes when I spoke. And people thought maybe he, this guy doesn't know a whole lot because he doesn't say anything. Uh, so, but with my friends, my classmates, I started bond, bonding, but it was difficult. It's a difficult transition culturally, linguistically, and uh, an environment, and I mean, there, it was difficult. Even uh, the beauty of Lexington, I, you know, I reflect back after I adjusted, you know, the rolling hills, the farms, uh, horse farms, and, you know, um, I remember going to Red River Gorge and places like that. Um, I, I did, you know, I have to say, you know, the pharmacy faculty at the hospital and the pharmacy staff and other um, classmates were very welcoming. So I had a really good experiences with them, but there were other issues out there that I, I was exposed that were not quite as good. But um, you know, I remember things, highlights of what my experience in Kentucky was. 
I remember the secretary for Paul Parker, her name was Penny. And she was such a sweet person. She will get coffee all the time for the residents and have it ready. Um, and uh, she, she uh, I, one of the things that I remember is that she had concerts because Elvis was coming to town. And, and he passed away before the concert. So she was really heartbroken because she, she had tickets to go to see Elvis. And, uh, but, you know, that's when he passed away. So I remember those days, uh, she was uh, down and not feeling too well. But, um, you know, Paul Parker to me was just a, a second father to me because he embraced me. Um, you know, this guy coming from a different part of the U.S. Um, by the way, the reason why we're part of the U.S. is because of after the Spanish-American War um, back in the late 1800s, so one of the uh, things that uh, the U.S. received was some uh, territories that were part of uh, Spain previously. So they kept Puerto Rico and they still is a territory of the U.S. for strategic reasons uh, and, and other reasons uh, related to um, the proximity to Latin America. Um, but anyway, uh, in Kentucky, another highlight is the UK won the NCAA championship in 1978. So we as residents have free tickets. So that was a wonderful thing uh, to be able to go to pretty much every game um, because I didn't have a lot of other things to do there. It was from school and, and, and the hospital to Kentucky games. Um, and so it was wonderful seeing that. Um, I didn't know much about NCAA until I arrived there. Actually, it took me a while to understand the rankings and how the whole thing worked. Um, I'm a basketball fan, um, but at the same time, it was more, um, you know, a regular league, uh, uh, semi-professional type of basketball. Um, another thing that I want to tell you from the pharmacy side po point of view is that, um, you know, that's uh, my first experience with a clinical trial. And it was uh, an, an amazing um, experience for residents because we had a, basically it was a phenytoin versus uh, placebo uh, clinical trial, a randomized, double blind. And it was for the purpose of uh, evaluating post-traumatic seizure prophylaxis. And so head trauma cases, we were on call 24 hours to go in and administer either placebo or phenytoin. Uh, so that was my very first experience. And I remember going to the OR uh, when they were doing a craniotomy on a patient and me, uh, me having to administer phenytoin. The loading dose was IV. The maintenance, first maintenance dose was IM that today we probably will not recommend giving phenytoin IM. But back then is uh, my first experience with giving intramuscular injections. Now we're doing a lot of vaccination. So is becoming very common, but back then was uh, for that purpose. I also got exposed to pharmacokinetics and that was, uh, you know, like uh, to me, it's an opening the door for clinical pharmacy. It's not the only thing that we do, but it, it was the only thing that uh, we uh, as, a, uh, as a profession were most prepared to do is dosing in renal or hepatic disease using blood levels and really understanding two compartment models and understanding Laplace transform. Those things were uh, required back then um, uh, to be done. So some of the other people that I remember is Rapp, Bob Rapp and Ken Raker and uh, Picoro, uh, Emerson, Anderson. There were a number of people that we worked with in different rotations. What was so special about that time is that our rotations were not one month or, or six weeks. They were like six months. So you really got big time um, education in that area. Uh, so overall, once I adjusted the first semester, then everything went smooth after that. But there was a time that I was ready to go back. Um, it was like two months into it. I was almost gonna go back and, and because I just didn't feel like I, I belonged there. Um, but my father convinced me that, he, that, I, that I could do it. 
And so I went ahead and did it. And, um, you know, my classmates were very helpful. Now I'm gonna show you something here that is an experience that I have in Kentucky. And it has to do with cultural identity and cultural sensitivity is one of the things that we emphasize in El Paso um, because we see this as a, an important thing, um, you know, that we understand each other. We come from different places. Uh, we have different uh, practices, religions, and, and uh, we have to respect each other. And, and so I did have a few things that happened when I was in Kentucky that were um, difficult to deal with. So I, I understand today cultural sensitivity training is a, such an important piece of what we do um, because uh, we come from different places. And so microaggressions is something that's still very common. And these are things that are in some cases, small messages, but I did have more direct big time messages when I was there. And I'm gonna, I have listed three comments that I was exposed to. And this was not by faculty or staff uh, or my classmates. This was by other students in, in different groups. Um, one early on that I learned is the statement was made to me that the program is going downhill because they admitted the first Puerto Rican. So that was me. Previously to me, they, I remember there was uh, Sal Pancorbo uh, was a Cuban American uh, that was there. And, and, and that was very helpful to me because I saw one person like me um, that I could relate to. But that statement was, was made by the upper classmate. And he basically made that statement in front of some of my classmates and, and they stood up to, to him. So this is not something that I heard directly, but it was indirectly. He came to me and you know, I, was, I was disappointed because uh, I felt like I had so, so the skills to, to do the program. And of course I, I completed it. And um, I, I thought I was a good person, um, um, but apparently that's the impression that this individual had before I got there. Hopefully by the time that he met me and, and um, uh, was able to experience who I was, um, he changed his mind. I never asked him. Um, this one, the second comment here was more of uh, some friend, 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 uh, friendly comment to me, but it was still like a little shocking when I was asked, do you carry a switchblade in your pocket? And then I understood later on that it was related to the West Side Story, uh, a bro the bro Broadway uh, story of uh, um, bang gangs in, in New York. And well, I didn't know what a switchblade was, and I never carry anything like that. I didn't have any reason to. So to me, it was like, why did you ask me that? <laughs> then I understood. I never saw that play, by the way. Uh, that was a New York play that was not in Puerto Rico. So now I understand it because uh, even Ruben Blades have a song that talks about that. And he's a salsa singer. Of course, I'm, I love Caribbean, Caribbean music and salsa specifically. So the, this one, the last one, uh, was actually an undergraduate student from New York that uh, we were in a gathering. Um, sometimes the faculty will have some events where they invited us to their house and we will have food and, and some beverages. Um, but basically this one was actually on the undergraduate student from New York that he told me, you can't be Puerto Rican, you're wearing shoes. Well, you know, I learned to wear shoes right away in Puerto Rico because in the tropics, um, I mean, walking without shoes is also uh, something that you're connected to earth, which is kind of a good thing. But in the tropics, you have diseases that you, you get transmitted through the skin. So I was wearing shoes, even if you, I only have one pair or two, I still wear in shoes because we, we learn that you have to protect yourself. So these are three examples of things 
that happened when I was there. Um, but in, you know, in general, my experience in Kentucky was a great experience. And I feel like it made me, it took me from somebody that had an attitude about learning to the highest level of what you can learn in pharmacy. When I finished in Kentucky, I was prepared to deal with pretty much anything related to uh, pharmacotherapy. And, and uh, I just knew how to figure out what to do in pretty much every situation uh, related to making decisions about medications. Then uh, I did a quick stop at the University of Puerto Rico as a faculty member, but the dean um, at that time didn't know what to do with me because I was like something new and, and they didn't know. So I, I got a little frustrated and said, you know, I need to go back to the States because I got all this training and they're asking me to be in my office and teach a few lectures and this is not what I want to do. So I ended up at the University of Cincinnati and I was there between the school, uh, the College of Pharmacy and the University Hospital. I had a joint position it was one of my first crossroads uh, where I have to make a decision because they wanted me to be a clinical coordinator and I wanted to be a clinical pharmacist. But I, uh, I, I had this training. So Paul Parker actually recommended that I interview there and, um, and actually they hired me. I helped develop clinical services. I helped develop, develop clinical pharmacokinetic services. I uh, did some studies. I got the first major clinical trial with a drug that is, it was called back then theanamycin. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows what theanamycin is, but if you do, please tell me. Well, apparently nobody knows what theanamycin is. Well, the reason why I knew about theanamycin is because as a clinical trial, you sign off for to conduct clinical trials with investigational drugs. And um, they give you the investigator brochure. And you actually have to sign a, a, a letter that indicates that you're not gonna share that information. So, it, but it does give you everything that you can know about a drug until that point. So, tianamycin later became imipenem, which is one of the two uh, ingredients in pramaxin. It was the very first carbapenem. So we had the opportunity to do clinical trials in intra-abdominal infections, complicated intra-abdominal infections, which were treated with two or three antibiotics with a single antibiotic. So it was a very exciting to, to be able to look at this and, and try to determine, can we do this? There, there was a little hesitation because until then you use multiple antibiotics. But anyway, after that, we did multiple clinical trials with cefotaxidine, cefotaxine, uh, fluoroquinolones, and of course, but the very first one was uh, primaxin or imipenem silastatin. So in, in this uh, area, I spent a lot of time in the intensive care unit with surgical patients, developed great relationships. Um, I was there for almost nine years. And I, I gained a lot of confidence. I have to make decisions. Uh, I was a clinical coordinator. And Blanca, please tell me if I, if I need to speed up. I just have so much to say and not enough time. <laughs> but uh, uh, basically, I was a clinical coordinator. And at one point, the, the director of the pharmacy left. And I was asked, we want you to be the uh, acting director or we're going to give it to this other guy uh, if you don't want to do it. And I thought, wait a second. The other guy is like a traditional, old-fashioned mentality about pharmacy services. I'm more of a progressive, you know, let's expand the role. Let's not just stay with dispensing and, and the basics, but let's do more. So I decided to go ahead and do it um, because I felt like the other the vision of the other possibility that was going to be the acting director was very limited, and I just didn't think that that was the right thing to do. And this is common throughout my career, where I have crossroads where I have to decide what direction do I go? Do I follow somebody else, or do I provide the leadership and, and, and use my vision? 
So that's what I did. And after that, I did become associate director for the, for the department. And I always had that joint appointment with the College of Pharmacy. So we were taking students and teaching in the pharmacotherapy types of lectures. And, and we did a lot of good things. Uh, one of the highlights is looking at, um, you know, by having clinical pharmacists in intensive care units, how much funding or savings you produce by uh, reducing duplication of therapy, by communicating with pharmacy in terms of making high uh, cost drugs and monitoring high risk medications. So a lot of work that we did uh, show that the impact was very positive. Uh, we more than pay our salaries by being there and savings in other ways. And of course, since then there have been other studies that have shown the benefits of what we do. From the Midwest, I ended up coming to Albuquerque. This is a, a, one of the Presbyterian hospital. Um, they have a network. So this is one of their facilities. It was in Rio Rancho, which is uh, just outside where Albuquerque, but that's basically where Intel has their, one of the biggest uh, manufacturing uh, but this is a facility that I worked for three years. Again, I, I was also with the College of Pharmacy. Um, so do always have those type of uh, appointments until then. So I was in this facility for three years. And then I was recruited to come to El Paso. So in here, basically what I learned is to fine tune some of my administrative skills, uh, my, my manager's skills, um, it was um, a very meaningful operation in terms of really learning more about the management side of pharmacy. So we ended up uh, coming here to the University of uh, Texas at El Paso. The reason why I came to El Paso is because my wife is from El Paso and I met her in Albuquerque and I was able to come down for, to meet her family on a few occasions. And then um, I was recruited to become a director of pharmacy at one of the facilities here. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, you know, University of Texas at El Paso is a big uh, university. Well, 25,000 students may seem like a small compared to UT Austin, which is more like 50,000. But for us, it's, it's the right size. And, and they may be a little more than we're we're going to continue uh, enroll in terms of the increase enrollment, but I don't think it's going to be uh, as much as some of the larger universities. So you still have some intimacy. So just to give you an idea, these are some of the degrees that we offer. Um, the, the type of students that we have, you know, uh, primarily Hispanic, 83%. Um, it used to be that it was only like 20%. But the previous president made an effort that the university had to look like the, the community. And that picture right there that you see in the middle, um, just to point out, uh, is Bhutanese architecture. The very first president, actually he was a dean of the School of Mines. His wife saw a National Geographic magazine and, basic, and saw a picture of, of Bhutan, and she recommended that architecture to be used for the school. And the, the white building that is in the center uh, of this plaza, that is actually a Bhutanese temple that was shipped from Bhutan as a gift. And it's there and you go inside and it's unique. Um, but anyway, it's not a religious um, place, but it's more of a cultural place. So this describes a little bit of the school. Um, we do have you know, a lot of uh, emphasis on, in terms of community engagement. So that's part of what we do. And we do contribute significantly to the economy. We are R1 university, so we do qualify in terms of research. It's a highly, it's an intensive research university. We do believe in access and excellence. Um, and some people, I remember talking to Bob Lewin, another grad, graduate of Kentucky 
when he was in uh, the dean at North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He said, that's very difficult to do. Um, well, we're doing it. And basically, as you could see, uh, there is significant research that is going on in here. We also have some global reach, um, including students from Bhutan that come to this area. And uh, we are ranked number one in the US in terms of uh, competitive research and student social mobility. And that is a major thing of what we stand for. And we are the top tier research uni university with a primarily, well, majority Hispanic student population. Uh, so a lot of our students uh, may have limited resources, so we are very affordable. This is the mission and, and the goals of the university. They just released this last week. So we still have access, excellence, but now we're emphasizing impact. And those are four of our goals, um, which are consistent with the goals of the School of Pharmacy. Uh, we put a, a little bit of a pause in terms of once a new president came on board um, and the, the previous um, strategic plan was kind of uh, supposed to stop in 2015, we wanted to see where, what direction are we going? Well, we're continuing to, to go in a consistent direction from where we were before and what the school stands for. Now, this is something that I just, sorry to bring it up, but I didn't realize about this until I came here. I had, I had, you know, I became a Kentucky fan, of course, for basketball. When I came here, then I realized that Texas Western College beat Kentucky by, back in 1966, and they had a all black starting team playing a, an all white uh, starting team from Kentucky. Uh, and Ken uh, Kentucky was uh, beaten by Texas Western College, which was unknown, um, but it did change a little bit of what the landscape was. Because when I went to Kentucky, they, the team was integrated, but before I wasn't. So this is a Western, Texas Western College became UTEP in 1967, so the year after. So sorry about that, but I think that is very meaningful because this changed college basketball. This particular game was an, an important game to change the future of college basketball. And I'm, I'm happy that we were part of that change. This is a little bit about the, the city. This is El Paso, Texas, uh, basically is there we're a border city. And in both of those pictures, you could see UTEP campus. In the background is Juarez, New Mexico. So that's how close we are. It's basically, right now it's a, it's a small river that runs through in between the two. Um, but um, we're also very close to Las Cruces, New Mexico. My house is actually a block away from New Mexico. So I'm on the far west of the state. We're in a uh, different time zone, we're mountain. And here it, it shows you a little bit of information about the, the region. And I'm not gonna go through every one of them because I, I have no idea how much time I have left. So Blanca, help me out. About <laughs> 10 minutes, 10, 15. Okay, we'll speed question. it up. Our school is actually outside campus. This is main campus here. And these are mountains in the background. And then our school is just a few blocks. It takes me about 20 minutes to walk to campus. Just a little bit about us. Uh, I inherited a 50 year old building um, for the School of Pharmacy, but we were able to upgrade uh, quite a bit of the inside of that building. So at this point, we not on, only have a School of Pharmacy, but we do have some College of Health Science programs in that building. These are our vision, mission, and goals. Um, we believe, uh, we basically want to be a pioneer in the advancement of pharmacy education through innovation, diversity, engagement, access, and leadership, which we call ourselves the ideal pharmacy school. But each one of those letters uh, means something 
in Spanish and in English, and they translate to ideal. And the goals, are, as you could see, are listed in there. We do have a statement related to the social. Sorry, let me go back. You know, it, we are a school that uh, understand that there are social determinants for health, and we recognize that there are some discrepancies, and that we stand for reducing disparities and uh, making uh, any population um, being able to have success in terms of their outcomes when we manage their therapies. So a little bit about where we are. We just uh, went through ACPE accreditation last week, the comprehensive accreditation. We did well. Um, we are, uh, this picture seen here shows show some of the challenges that we have recently in terms of the pandemia. Uh, we had to have a white coat ceremony there. You have on the, the top picture is actually our chairman of pharmaceutical science, Dr. Mark Cox and our chairman or chairwoman or the pharmacy practice and clinical sciences, Dr. Amanda Loya. This is our president. She had a speech and we did it outdoors. Um, we do run a clinic that we're giving vaccination. To. As of this week, we, are, have, done, we have given 21,000 vaccines. So students are getting quite a bit of experience giving those. We have done a lot of things virtual, which has been very challenging. And here we have pictures of faculty and students at the clinic. This is myself delivering some vaccines. I don't call myself a runner. I call myself a communication coordinator. And here is a, one of our faculty members receiving vaccination from a student. This is one way that we promote vaccination. Es un luchador, it's on the street, it's called Santa Fe. It's a mural that was built, was painted by the local artist. Ponte vacuna, ponte la vacuna. So basically, a luchador is the one encouraging people to get vaccinations. In El Paso, we have a relatively high um, uptake of uh, vaccines. But they, with all the wrong information that was put out by different people out there, uh, we have seen some hesitation. So we, even though we are pushing to, for people to get vaccinated, back in, in the fall, we have really difficult surge here where we have to build some temporary hospitals to manage patients. Uh, it was a very difficult time. So that's one thing that I can tell you, but I do want to tell you about this. August 13, that was a, an incredible time. And that's probably when I felt how racism can go wrong so badly. A 21 year old drove more than 10 hours from Dallas, a suburb to come here and he killed 23 people at Walmart and injured another 24. Um, this was a very sad, I took this picture. I had to go there. This is a couple of days after the shooting. And he only did it because he was in response to the Hispanic invasion of Texas, which is wrong. This is a map of the United States and Mexico before the Mexican American war. And as you could see, Texas was part of Mexico until the expansion of the US. So now the map is different, but the Hispanics and the Mexicans and the native people were here before. So this kid uh, was misinformed. This is called the Grand Candela. Candela means like the flame. And it's a, a, a monument that was built just to remember those people that were killed and injured there. Now I like this statement. The most important thing about Maya Angelou is when she talk about we are more alike than different. So that to me is a very powerful statement. And uh, that's the way I, I see things. And I hope other people can do the same. In the middle of the pandemia, I took this picture. Now, one of the things that you could see here, 
I didn't realize that there was emergency 24 hours, but I, I saw that as this is where we are, but this is the hope that we can look forward in terms of what we can do. These are challenging times, but every challenge brings opportunities. I was able to start hiking back the mountains, Franklin Mountains. This is Aztec Cave, which is up in the Franklin Mountain. It's about uh, almost 6,000 feet above sea level. Um, and it has the view of the Southwest. Um, my house is far, you know, part of the valley there somewhere. Now, the, I call this Los Cuatro Deans. Uh, one of the most recent meetings I have, uh, the, the opportunity to be to, with other three deans from UK. You got Don Latrende, you got Henry Mann, you have Joe DePiro, and then you have Jose Rivera. Those are Los Cuatro Deans that were at one of the ASHP meetings not too long ago when we could come together <laughs> and actually yeah. hug each other. All these individuals were there when I was there. Uh, so uh, we share, they're not all classmates, but they were there during my time. And I just want to say thank you for inviting me to speak with you. And I want to um, see if there's any questions or comments. But I want to give you one last message, which is do the best you can. Whatever you're doing, whatever your uh, job is, you have to have pride in whatever you did. You did the best you can. So questions or comments? I know I may be running out of time here. I see Melody has a question. Hi, Jose. Um, when I was there doing one of the interim ACPE visits, uh, one of the things I was most impressed about was your Spanish requirement. Could you elaborate a little bit on that for everyone? Yes, uh, okay, we, we decided that we needed to do this because of the community that we live in, but we also understand that there are, this Spanish is the most common language that is spoken at home at, after English throughout the US. So here is, is obvious. Uh, we have, for, for example, university medical centers, they have clinics where they, uh, they're, there are great places to place students. Well, the directors of that uh, department says, if they can't speak Spanish, don't send them because it, we, we, most of our patients uh, speak Spanish. And um, so they, the ability to communicate here is so critical. Uh, so we made a decision that this was necessary, not only because of El Paso, this is obvious for us, but I, I think we need Spanish speaking pharmacists in other parts of the countries. And if you look at pockets throughout the US, uh, there are populations out there and this is to be uh, as effective as possible in terms of being able to communicate with patients effectively. And we have done it in a really uh, intentional way, which is integrated to the curriculum. So when we present diseases, we tend to present them as primary care first, because we don't want the patient to end up in the intensive care unit. So we emphasize primary care, we emphasize prevention. So when we do that, if we're talking in physical assessment, if we're, we're talking about how to do eye exam or food ex exam, then we switch that and talk about el pies or los ojos y el, y el, el pancreas, and, and it's all lined up. So when you go to the Spanish class, you're talking about, about diabetes. So you switch and you say the basics of diabetes, La azúcar en la sangre. So it's all very thoughtful, you know, integrated. And uh, we put an emphasis because I, I, even our Spanish speaking students don't know the technical aspects. So it's actually a three year program uh, where we have a Spanish throughout, but it's highlighting the most important thing. We're not going to get down to the pharmacokinetics of drugs in Spanish, but it, it's more about the communication that you need to have with patients at their level, which most, most of them are gonna be basic. Uh, you don't wanna complicate things too much for patients in terms of the technical side of um, medications and diseases. So it's, it's very, very much 
integrated throughout the curriculum in what is, is communication of the basic information. And we have three levels. We have introductory, intermediate, and advanced Spanish. And we try to target each group to gain on whatever their baseline is. But our goal is that they can at least have basic communication. If you come in, we do require a basic Spanish for uh, course as a prerequisite. Is that good enough? I, I have a lot more to say. You know, the Calle 13 has a song that says, you know, I tengo mucho que, que escribir y poco papel. So that's basically saying, I have a lot to say, not enough time. <laughs> so there, there's a question in the chat from Dr. Chappell asking how important is reverse integration for your college and institution, i.e. how important is it to recruit other ethnicities, black, white, Asian, to your college? And yeah. what barriers do you see for that? Well, we happen to have um, representation from African-Americans, Asians, uh, Africans, and, and white people in our, in our school. And we do have that um, in faculty. We believe faculty role models are critical if you want to bring certain populations to, to come to your school uh, as a student. You need to have role models. We have tried to recruit African-American faculty, and that has been more difficult. And I, I uh, actually, we were almost uh, gonna, was gonna, we were gonna be able to bring an, an African-American faculty, but he decided to take a job uh, in a more specialized environment where the, that he trained. And I, I wish he would recognize that it was, you can't specialize too much, <laughs> but that's what, I, what happened. It was somebody that was highly trained in infectious diseases and antibiotics and wanted an infectious disease position. And we needed something that had a little more broad. So that, you know, um, we, we happen to have a, a, a large presence here of military. So we are getting, the population of African-Americans in El Paso is not that large. Um, and the same thing with Asians, but, um, but we have with the military, at least the African-Americans have is so, something that we're gaining. We're able to get some students, um, but yeah, we're very aware that you know, we're diverse, but uh, we're diverse in terms of, uh, you know, more Latinos than any other ethnic group. But we, this is the community. So I have a question. I, I am interested in what it's like with community practice in, in a border city where people can move across the border and have vastly different access to drugs and pharmacy. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that we have studied. And let me tell you this, the study that we did, we, we found that in about 30%, 33% of the population of the Paso have gone across the border to purchase medications in the last 12 months. So it's very common and we sometimes the medications can be the same, or sometimes the medications can be more problematic for us in terms of the use of, like for example, steroids, a common use for pain and all the side effects that you can have if depending on how you're using it uh, or combination of anti-psychiatric medications uh, or um, the access to antibiotics used to be uh, much higher, but the me Mexican government recognized that they needed to do something. But yes, we have a lot of people. And when the things got a little tough in, in Juarez in, with the cartel, what happened is instead of people going to purchase, somebody that was going to Juarez purchased for them. So it became more of, you know, uh, somebody will bring you um, medications a lot of them are, are less, you know, they're, they're not as costly. So it, there is an incentive, incentive. Pharmacies do not have a pharmacist. They're usually a, a clerk that runs the pharmacy. Pharmacists is a different profession in Mexico. And uh, even in some areas, they're trying to 
be a little bit more clinical. Uh, most pharmacists are chemists. And not, um, and so clinical pharmacy is not a common thing, but there are some places where that is becoming, uh, at least there's an attempt to become more clinically involved. But yeah, I have a lot to say about that too for another occasion. So, so the way I look at the evolution of clinical pharmacy is that, you know, we knew the drug, we had to learn the disease, but then we have to know the patient. And then you have to know where the community, where they are to, to, to have the whole picture. And um, so I actually have a model that I develop about this because I think it's important, especially in primary care, but it could even be in the ICU because I have patients that have come in with complications because they were taking some herbals or some other products from what is, and then having complications that we have to address in the ICU because people come in back and forth in the access. Millions of people go across in a month. Yeah. Thanks so much. So we're almost out of time. If there aren't any more questions, can people join me in thanking Dr. Rivera for his talk. <laughs> so uh, Kip, I don't know if this is what you were expecting, but at the same time, you know, if, if there is anything I can do in the future to, to make it more consistent with the goals, I'll come back and talk <laughs> about. <laughs> You're always welcome back. And thanks so much. It's been okay. great. All Take right. care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Muchas gracias. De nada. <laughs> es un placer. Thank you. It was a really great presentation. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.